The singing sounds real good, church. Love being together and singing together and taking the supper and praying together. Just uh, no place I'd rather be. I usually don't ask for, for prayers, but I am going to solicit your prayers for this Wednesday. I'm going to, I've been having some trouble with my knees, and I'm going to try stem cell therapy. And that's going to be Wednesday at noon, and so please be praying about that. It's, uh, it's um, kind of still in the, in the test stage. It's not a real popular thing, but uh, I've been studying it, and I think that's the way I need to go right now. So would appreciate your prayers. We got to go yesterday to Roland to their Reaching New Levels of Faith workshop and tim lewis my dear friend from north macarthur was the speaker did a fabulous job and it was good to see them uh, roland is a very small congregation but some sweet people there and always enjoy getting a chance to catch up with them and and so uh, just a real enjoyable time we're going to be in the word if you'll get your bible open to that passage in mark 12 that we just had read for us just a moment ago and then there is also an outline of the sermon in the bulletin. Now if you pull out that center page, you'll see two sermon outlines. The one on Do Not Hinder Them, that is going to be for 6 o'clock this evening. And then this morning we're going to talk about Not Far From the Kingdom. Now those sound like they're totally unrelated, but they're not. It's actually kind of two parts of the same sermon. We'll be in Mark 12 this morning, Mark 9 this evening, but we're going to talk about our friends and our family who are not far from the kingdom. And then tonight, if you'll come back, we're going to talk about not hindering them from being a part of the kingdom. And I think you'll see how these two passages really go well together. You know, it would have been a, a Tuesday. Around the end of March was the time period. Jesus, who spent most of his ministry in Galilee, had come down into Jerusalem. And he had entered Jerusalem on that Sunday before this, and they laid down the palm branches, and you're familiar with the scene. On the day before that Monday is when he'd gone into the temple, and they were buying and selling the doves, and, and he cleared the temple out. And it made him mad. In Mark chapter 11, it says uh, in verse 18 that these chief priests and these scribes, they wanted to destroy him but they were afraid of the people. And so they, they tried on Tuesday, which begins in verse 27. He just gets into the temple, and there's the chief priests and the scribes and the elders, and they want to question him about his authority. What authority do you have? <laughs> that did not go well for them. Uh, Jesus handled that question in such a way that, uh, well, it, it made them look bad. So they gave up on him. Uh, the, the next group to try was the in, in chapter 12, verse 13, the Pharisees and the Herodians. They tried to trap him in a statement, and they, they wanted to ask him about whether they should pay taxes to Caesar or not. So that didn't go well either. <laughs> and the way Jesus handled that, he really turned it back on them, and so they didn't mess with him anymore. Next, it was the Sadducees in verse 18, and they wanted to question him about marriage at the resurrection. Guess what? That didn't go well either for them. Just all these groups, and he's, he just came into the temple to teach, keep in mind. He's not seeking these people out, but they're trying to tear him up. Well, all this time, there was a scribe who was watching what was going on, and that's our text in chapter 12, verse 28. Let's read that again together. One of the scribes came and heard them arguing and recognizing that he had answered them well, that's an understatement, asked him, what commandment is foremost of all? Jesus answered, the foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater 
than these. Now look at the scribe's reply, verse 32. The scribe said to him, Right, teacher, you have truly stated that he is one, there is no one else besides him, and to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as himself is much more than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. Verse 34, while Jesus saw that he had answered intelligently, that's in contrast to the other answers that he had received, he answered intelligently. He said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one would venture to ask him any more questions. The first thing on your outline there, a lawyer, a scribe, asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? Is it a lawyer or is it a scribe? Well, in, in Matthew chapter 22, verse 35, the parallel account, he's called a lawyer. Here he's called a scribe, the same person. Well, which one is he? A scribe was somebody who was professionally trained from the time they were little boys, were trained to copy the Bible and to be a copier of the law of Moses, you had to know the law. You had to be a lawyer. Now, when we hear lawyer, we think civil lawyer. No, this is a religious lawyer. And so he was both. He was a scribe, but he was also a lawyer. His, his question to them is, which commandment is foremost of all? Now, maybe that doesn't sound controversial, but it was in that time. Because the rabbis had gone through all of the teachings of Moses, and they had counted all of the commandments. They had added them up. 365 negative commandments and 248 positive commandments. So 613 commandments in the law of Moses. And then the rabbi stepped back and said, now how are we going to get people to keep 613 commandments? We don't even keep 613 commandments. They, did, they probably didn't say that part, but they, they could have. <laughs> Nobody keeps 613 commandments, so what are we going to do? Well, let's kind of go through these and let's see which ones might be more important than others. So they, they actually rated them. And they, they put them in two categories. They had one category that they called the firm commandments. Those were the more important ones. Got to follow those. Those are the firm commandments. And then we have the relaxed commandments. <laughs> those were less important. Uh, if you kept them, fine. If not, yeah, no big deal. You know, that's, that's why, and I don't, I don't have my remote. What, what's the next slide here, please? In Matthew chapter 22, verse 35, it was the lawyer who asked this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment? And then the next slide, please. That's why Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verse 19 says, whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments, have you ever wondered why he would say one of the least of these? He's not stating what he believed. He was using the terminology of the time. He's saying, even these ones you call relaxed, these, these non-important, there is nothing in the Word of God that is unimportant. So it was very controversial. What is the greatest commandment? What do we boil it down to? We've got these ones that are more serious than others, but which one is the most important? And Jesus' answer, I'll tell you what the greatest commandment is. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. That's the Shema. Every Jew, man, woman, and child, quoted the Shema when they got up in the morning and when they went to bed at night. They did it twice a day. They would wake up and they would wake up and say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And then when they went to bed at night, they would say it again. Every person there that day would have grown up doing that. You did it every day. Every person did that who was a Jew. And so it's rather interesting that Jesus would misquote the verse. If you look closely, if you read the account in Deuteronomy chapter 6, 
starting in verse 4, and you can do that, and then parallel it with what we just read there in chapter 12 of Mark and verses 29 and 30, he misquotes the verse. Now watch this. He says, love, okay, first of all, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Okay, that's fine. That's, that's part of it. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart. Yeah, that's correct. You should love the Lord God with all your soul. Okay, got that. And with all your mind. Where did that come from? That's not in Deuteronomy 6. Jesus added that. And if you're thinking, well, we're not supposed to add to the word, Jesus can do what he wants, okay? I'm not going to tell him he can't. But he added, love the Lord your God with all your mind. Why did he add that? Maybe he added that for our sake. Maybe he's trying to tell you and me, love God with your mind. Use your mind. Maybe he's saying it for the sake of those who were standing there that day. All these ones who were trying to come and trip him up with words. Love the Lord your God with your mind. Or maybe it was for that scribe. Use your mind, scribe. Because let me tell you something. You're not far from the kingdom of God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Why is that the greatest commandment? Because... If you don't keep that one, the rest don't really matter, do they? I mean, if you're going to do all these things and you're not going to love God, what's the point? Next in your notes, what, what may have been intended as an argument seems to have turned into a friendship. And I say that because in verse 32, the way the scribe responded, he's not being naked, he's just right, teacher. You truly stated he is the one and there is no one else beside him. And then the way Jesus responded back to him. He knows that he's, he's in, answered intelligently. He says, you're not far from the kingdom. I would love to think that this scribe continued to kind of listen to Jesus. He watched the, the crucifixion. Possibly he was there. Maybe he was there 55 days after this on the day of Pentecost. Maybe he was one of the 3,000 that was baptized. Wouldn't that be neat? Jesus says you're not far from the kingdom. On that day, he would have been in the kingdom. That would have been great. Maybe it happened that way. Or maybe he succumbed to the, the peer pressure, never did obey the gospel, and he died in his sins, not far from the kingdom of God. I don't know what happened to him. But I do know, next point here, Jesus did not say to this scribe, you're in the kingdom. But he did say, you're not far from it. In the same way, next point, we, we all have friends, neighbors, family, co-workers, who are not far from the kingdom of God. And as I'm talking, I hope you're getting a person in your mind. I want you to think of somebody that you care about deeply, but they're not a member of the church. They're good people, perhaps, and, and they're not far from the kingdom, but they're not in the kingdom. I want you to think about this person as we're, we're studying this. They, they're close to the kingdom, but next, unfortunately, they're not in the kingdom. But at least they're not far from it. You see what I'm saying? I mean, there's other people out there, and they are far from the kingdom. They're hard to reach. They don't believe in anything. You've got to go through all of it with them. Uh, they're hard to lead to Christ because they have all this unbelief that they have to overcome. On the other hand, there are souls, and, and they're close. I mean, they're close. You talk to them, and they believe in this, and they, they, have, uh, they believe in Jesus. They, they love the Word of God, perhaps. They, they believe in a moral standard uh, guided by God's Word. They believe in this instruction. I mean, they're close. We all have family like that. Friends, co-workers, classmates. They're in that position. Next, these people at least have a form of religion. And they likely believe that they are already saved. But that sometimes that's where the problem is. But the good news is, if they are close to the kingdom, unfortunately that's not the same as being in the kingdom. 
I grew up in Colorado, most of you know that, and, and we would always hear stories about, <laughs> I think uh, our parents made sure we heard these stories about fearing the mountains and, and, and respecting what can happen. Uh, the snow is pretty deep up there, there's a lot of blizzards. I heard this story about this, this one man whose car slid off the road. He was only a couple of miles from his house. He decided to walk in the blizzard to get to his house. He couldn't see and he thought he could, he knew the way well enough and he could tell by the trees, but sometimes he couldn't even see the trees. He walked for an hour and then two hours, and he was only two miles from his house. It should have only taken 20 minutes to get there. He still wasn't at his house. Three hours went by. He's walking and walking. Finally, he gave up. And he died, and he, he was uh, He was frozen. Hypothermia. When they found him the next morning, he was 100 feet from his house, 100 feet from his front door. He was close. <laughs> he was close, but he wasn't there. You know, John received a revelation in which he was instructed to measure the temple. Let's look at that, please, in the book of Revelation, chapter 11. Jesus is instructing John, he's giving them this revelation, and, and, and uh, John is going through all these experiences, and it says in chapter 11, verse 1, it says, there was given me, this would be John, there was given John a measuring rod like a staff. And someone said, get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. That is a key phrase, those who worship in it. I want you to notice that. Verse 2, leave out the court, which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations, and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. Now this is revelation. This is, this is not literal. This is a, an apocalyptic, a picture uh, of, uh, of things that were happening at that time period. The book of Revelation was written in the first century after Christianity had started. This is written to Christians. And so the temple, the physical temple, was in Jerusalem. Now, depending on when you date the book of Revelation, that temple may have already been destroyed. Either way, even if you date it early, he's not talking about the physical temple because he's talking about the church. And the church is, needs to be measured. He, he says we need to measure and see who is worshiping in it, who is inside of the kingdom. He says leave out the outer court. That doesn't count. What's the point here? The, there's a judgment going to come upon the Roman Empire. And a measurement needs to be taken so that those who are in the temple, they're going to escape judgment. Those who are on the outside are going to be Punish. Next point. There were some who were not in the temple. They were in the outer court. They were close. But they weren't there. And when the judgment came, those in the outer court would not escape punishment. Being close is not the same as being in. It's different. Sometimes we're close, but we're really not there. I really do hope that you're going to be back at 6, because we're going to talk about making sure that we, we don't uh, keep those out, that we don't uh, hinder those who are trying to get into the kingdom. And, I, and let me go on a, on a rant here. Maybe you think I already have, but I, let, me, uh, <laughs> let me do another one here. Are you going to be back at 6 this evening? If not, where are you going to be? I want you to think about this. The, the kingdom, the Lord's family, is going to be assembled here at 6 o'clock. You're part of the family, are you not? Why wouldn't you be here with the family? This is where the family meets. You're, you're part of it. And, and I want you to think about, you know, what, what, what excuse would you give? Well, 
I, I've got to work, or I've got, uh, I've got family coming in, or, or I've, got, uh, I've got homework I need to do, or whatever it is. You know, we have a sister here who put herself through pharmaceutical school. And she went to Oklahoma City to do that. She drove back and forth. And she never missed Sunday morning, Sunday night, or Wednesday night. She was here every single time. And I know the way she did that, she, she was seeking first the kingdom. That was the first thing that went on her schedule. And then she scheduled her classes and her study time around that. And she had to make some sacrifices to get her study time in. But she did that. And if she wasn't here, she was meeting with the kingdom in Oklahoma City. It's the only time she wasn't here. You have homework to do tonight? You can't make it to church? If we have time to be in a duck blind or to be on a, out on the boat on the lake or watching our ball game during the week, why do we not have time to assemble with the Lord's church? Now, every time I speak about attendance, I need to talk to the other side. So the rest of you, shut your ears for a second. Those of you who are elderly and you cannot drive at night, we just had daylight savings time, the sun's going to go down earlier, we're not even going to start service tonight until it's dark. So please don't put yourself at some huge risk to be here. There are times it's okay to miss services. There's times God understands. You know, if you're laid up tonight in the hospital and you're in a coma and you miss church, God understands, all right? He really, he does. I'll tell you what I do. I'll tell you what I do. Anytime I think I'm going to miss service, I pray about it, but here's how I pray. I pray as if God is standing right here in front of me. And I'm telling God, God, I'm going to have to miss services tonight, or I'm going to have to miss Bible class on Wednesday night. And here is the reason. If I tell God this, and you have to know God to be able to do this correctly, and God would say back to me, I understand. I totally understand. It's okay, Curtis. It's okay. If he tells me that, then I, I feel pretty good. But if he would say, you know what, Curtis? If you just made some changes, you could be here. Then I know I need to get my little tail into church. That's what I need to do, right? All right. I'm going to get off my rant, get back on to talking about those who are not far from the kingdom. How am I going to do this? Okay, if you come to church, you set a good example for those who are not far from the kingdom. How's that for, for tying it back in? Last point here, or second to last point. If you love your friends who are not far from the kingdom, do all you can to influence them to come into the kingdom. You know what's really hard about this subject, and I've, I've prayed about this a lot, is I felt this way, I know you have too. If someone says that they're Christians, then really who am I to say that they're not? That's the hard question, isn't it? They, they say that they're Christians. Who am I? I'm not judge and jury. I'm not going to, on judgment day, I, I don't get to decide who goes into heaven or not. God's not going to ask me my opinion on judgment day. And doesn't, you know, Matthew chapter 7, I'm going to put my eyes on it. You can if you want. It's not in your notes. But in Matthew 7, doesn't, doesn't Jesus say not to judge? You know, he says here, Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, do not judge or you too will be judged. Am I wrong to say, I have this friend and, and I suspect they're not saved? Um, maybe they are. I don't know. I'm not supposed to judge. Well, when Jesus said that, though, did he mean don't use judgment? <laughs> did he mean don't use any discernment? If you go on to read, this is the, the passage where... He is explaining the one who has the, the log hanging out of his eye, and he's trying to get the speck out of the other guy's eye. And he says, get the log out of your own eye. That's the type of judging that he's saying is wrong. He's not saying don't use judgment. He says in the next verse, in the way that you judge, it'll be, you will be judged, or in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it'll be measured to you. Well, you know, this is the standard of measurement I use right here. And if you want to measure me by this standard, I'm good with that because this is what I want to live by anyway. I, we've got to make a judgment. And we may be wrong in our judgment. 
But we need to know if, if our friends who are religious and they're good people, really are they in the kingdom? I mean, you know. You know John chapter 3, verse 5. It says, unless one is born of the water and the Spirit, they cannot enter the kingdom of God. Have they been born of the water and the Spirit? Just because somebody is religious doesn't mean that they're saved. Right here in the same, same chapter, in verse 21, he says, Not everyone who says to me, the Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. And in the next verse, verse 22, he talks about religious people saying, well, Lord, we prophesied in your name and we drove out demons and we performed miracles. And you know what happens in verse 23? He says, I never knew you. Away from me, you who practice lawlessness. I'm telling you, there's people who are religious and they're good people. But if we don't think they're lost, we won't try to save them. And I would much rather get to heaven and find out I was wrong about somebody and find out there's somebody there. You know, I'm not going to go over to God and say, hey, are you sure about this one, God? I mean, I'm not going to do that, you know. I'm going to say, amen, I'm glad they're here. I would rather do that, though, and know that I reached out to them than not reach out to them and get there and find out they're not there because I thought, well, you know, maybe God will just give them a little, you know, little nudge at the end. Just, just let it slide. It's not going to work. We need to care enough about people to talk to them about their condition. Whether they are way, way lost in our minds or if they're not far from the kingdom of God. So let's end it this way. If you're here today and you see the kingdom but you're not part of it, the good news is you're not far from the kingdom. You're close. Some of you have been studying the Bible. You know what the Bible says. Some of you have been attending here for a long time. You've heard the gospel preached. And you know that there's something you haven't done. Oh, you believe, and perhaps you've repented of your sins, but you have never been immersed into Christ Jesus. You've never been born of the water and the Spirit. In other words, you've never been born again. We're going to sing a song of invitation. We'd love for you to make that confession of faith today. We'll baptize you into Christ. But maybe you have done that. Maybe you are here and you are part of the kingdom, but you've not been faithful in your outreach and in your, your sharing of faith with others. Maybe you're needing prayers for that. Whatever your need, please come as we stand and sing.